Welcome to Everything Life and Real Estate. Let's get started with our hosts, Linda McKissick and Dana Gentry. We need to record. We need to be recording this. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to Everything Life and Real Estate. I'm Linda McKissick. And I'm Dana Gentry. <laughs> Hey, Dana. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. We're like, hold on, stop. We have to start recording. John's already yeah. dropping nuggets. I know. And you know, you and I do that all the time. We start talking and we have such great stuff. And we're like, oh crap, we should have had the recorder on. So <laughs> Dana, would you like to introduce our guest today? Yes, I would love to. Uh, our guest is John White, is a uh, friend of mine. I met him through Adam. Um, I, I used to say I was I was terrible with money and I didn't understand any of it. And John I spent like two hours on the phone with me for the first time. And I think we talked 75 percent about our lives and 25 percent about about financial uh, things, issues, topics. And then from there, I was like, OK, he has the heart for people. He cares. He's super knowledgeable and smart. Um, and he's just uh, a, a great person in general. So, John, we're really excited to have you on today. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you, Dana and Linda. Uh, okay, John, you want to just start? I know you were kind of giving this, and we were like, no, wait a minute, hold on. Sure. <laughs> Do you want to just start by giving everybody a little bit about your about kind of your background and just the Linda always says you were born and then what, but we don't have time for all of that. So just <laughs> little pieces of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I was born, and then I was born in South Carolina, and I met my wife in college. She's from the North Atlanta suburbs area. So I'm married to Carrie. Been married 13 years. We live in North Atlanta, and uh, I've moved to Atlanta in 2008 and immediately got connected to the firm that I'm a part of now as a, what I would call a wealth advisor and uh, partnered with Northwestern Mutual um, and been doing that for over 10 years. And so, I, you know, I'm just kind of thinking about our time together and how we all met. Um, I think it's probably where I'll start with everyone is my, my story is a story of relationships and I played uh, minor league baseball for a short period of time, but I, I, I really learned several lessons and one was uh, the gift of understanding that you truly do become who you surround yourself with and my experience as a, a baseball player and as a small college baseball player was I, I got a lot better really quickly when the talent around me went to a whole nother level and so coming into my career at 24 25 years old you know i i knew that the business world and life in general work the exact same way. So I had this mindset of, you know, I'm not the smartest in the room. I did go to college. No one's heard of the college I had my degree from, you know, so I, I have to take other angles. And yet the angle that I've taken is the, is the most important angle, in my opinion, which is people. And so early on, I began to realize that, okay, Whoever I want to become, you know, life is about surrounding yourself with those people that also um, it's very much kind of who I am as a person. I think even back to Lynn's point, who I was born to be, you know, everyone's a little bit different. But for me, that really resonated. And so life has really taken off in the last 13 years. And it's really been one uh, one relationship at a time. I can kind of, tra kind of trace my whole uh, track record. I know Gary Keller's famous of saying success leaves clues. My, my clues are tied to people and kind of one relationship leads to another relationship leads to another relationship. Now, in my business as a wealth advisor, I tell other financial advisors when they start, you're really in the prospecting business. You're in the relationship business. You learn how to be a financial advisor later. I think in the real estate world, it's the exact same thing. Everybody wants to learn all the ins and outs of a contract. If you don't have a house to sell, it doesn't matter what you know about the contract. So. Same in my world, you know, if you, if you don't have relationships and you're not sitting in front of people and having conversations, you're not going to really learn. So um, that was my focus early on and, and, and one relationship leads to another and I'm on a podcast with you two wonderful ladies. So John, you and I were talking on the front end and I said, I'm just going to be honest and share something that I'm thinking and maybe other people think the same way. But, you know, I've always thought, and I guess because I'm so heavily invested in real estate, that 
if I got with a financial advisor, first of all, I didn't really understand who they are and what the differences are. And, but if I got with one, all they were going to try to do is talk me out of investing all in real estate like I am and invest in stocks. And I didn't, that wasn't the means I wanted to build wealth. So maybe other people think the same way. And so help us understand what in the world is a financial planner and why do we need them? And especially as realtors and who needs them and who doesn't need them and all that good stuff. Good question. Well, I, don't know, I don't know that it's the most exciting thing for people to talk about. So I try to bring a little bit of a, a little bit of energy to these subjects, but I'll pretend for a moment. I do a lot of speaking and training in my industry, just like the book of you. So it's not uncommon that I'd be in front of a room with 150 people to 3000 people who are all in my industry, financial advisors. And I'm talking about how I built my business. And one thing that I will always share with them is, you kind of have to find your your uniqueness as an advisor and who appreciates that and mm -hmm. what are you interested in okay so if i'm talking to a group of advisors in our world we would look at it as niche industries or niche professions in in your world a lot of times it, i've heard it dominate your street to dominate that neighborhood to dominate that zip code and that you know that's kind of where you nest your niche is what we would call it and so, you know, for me or for other advisors, what's common or what I, what I would teach is you find your niche of industry that you work uniquely well in, that you're interested in, that you connect well with people. So, Linda, for me, early on, I met with a doctor at one of the hospitals in Atlanta. I met with an attorney. I met with a CPA. And I just thought, you know, that wasn't that fun. I didn't really enjoy these meetings. I don't think I really want clients who are doctors. Now, over time, I've met entrepreneurs who are doctors. But when I met people in real estate and business owners and people who believed that they could do anything and they believed anything was possible, I loved those meetings. I got energy from them. So here, here's where I'm going to answer your question, Linda. For advisors who are good at what they do, there's a lot of great advisors who work with doctors and doctors need great advisors. I just tell people I'm not that advisor. And I'm very confident and comfortable with saying that. Okay. So for individuals who are out in the marketplace or individuals who are in real estate, what I, what I would encourage people to do is, you know, when you're meeting advisors, you know, is their niche your space? Do they understand real estate? How many clients do they have that have built their wealth in, in real estate? Because if it's not majority of their business, it's probably not going to be the right fit. Now, what's beautiful about real estate and real estate entrepreneur and that industry is that you have a lot of self-doers. You have a lot of people who are creating their wealth themselves. And a lot of advisors are promoting that they help people create wealth. I actually tell people in that I don't help you create wealth. I really help you protect it. I help you think about things, your blind spots. I help, you know, data say, okay, well, 20 years from now, here's what life is going to look like because I've seen it because I have other clients. So, you know, as a real estate professional or entrepreneur, it can be frustrating to meet with advisors because it can be a little bit of headbutting on, you know, philosophy. but the reality is everyone needs a financial partner. Everyone has blind spots. Everyone doesn't know what they don't know. And if you're really smart, Lyndon, you could learn it. You don't have time to go learn it, right? So... It might just be a little segment of your balance sheet or it might just be a little segment of your world that you kind of need someone looking over or someone looking around the corner for you. Um, but but for real estate entrepreneurs, that's going to be a little bit tougher to find. because that's not, that's not the traditional advisor. So I think it's important to understand, you know, you are going to create your own wealth. No one's going to do it for you. The beauty of being a real estate entrepreneur is you have unique knowledge and expertise. That most people don't have and one of the most timeless assets that exist. But you still need a partner. So then how do you find that partner? And that's kind of where I would say, you know, um, you know, finding an advisor who has really uh, built their business and niching in the space that is of interest to you. Wealth, what does that actually mean? Does that mean uh, you look for places where we're paying too much taxes? Does that mean, what does that actually mean? Does that mean protection after I'm gone? What does it mean? Yeah, I, th I think it means a little bit of all of it. You know, when you, you build this big pot of money, right, that pot might be your first $100,000. That pot might eventually be 10 million in net worth. It might eventually be a hundred million net worth. And so it's, it's just like if you're going around and I've never used this analogy before, but I'm just making this up as we go. You're grabbing a bunch of berries, right? You're the only person in your neighborhood or your farm has got any food and berries. Like, what do you do? People are going to try to take it from you. So you're like, no, these are mine. 
right? Well, there are people in the world like that too. It's called the IRS. It's called creditors. It's called the person that you back, run into the back of at a red light, right? It's it's the market volatility. It could be banks, right? It could be over leveraged. So you know, there's so you kind of begin to build something that becomes stable. And at some point, you're probably asking a question, which we've talked about before, which is how much more do I need, right? So you're going to keep growing, but at some point, it's like, how much more do we really need? And so my point in that, Lynn, is not that you stop growing. It's that, okay, we should take a little time to protect what we have. So as we build beyond just what we need, we're doing it with a, a fence around, you know, our pot of gold, if you will, or, you know, our vision for whatever we're going to do with that wealth. And so, yeah, taxes is the biggest, the biggest liability. That's the biggest person taking your chunk. And I always tell people as it relates to taxes, and there's a lot of political views out there. You know, at the end of the day, I, I think I heard Tony, Diana's husband say, you know, I believe in paying taxes. I just, I just want to pay my fair share. And I think he said one time, you know, taxes is the rent that you pay to live in the United States. But I just want to pay my fair share. So. You know, we, we, we're going to pay taxes, but I think there's parts where maybe, you know, we can protect a little bit more. And ultimately, we choose, we get to choose where we want to give money. You know, a lot of people don't necessarily trust the IRS. So it's like, hey, I want to do good with my money, but I also want to pick and choose where my money goes. So that's a lot of what the pr protection would be, uh, Linda. Or just uh, down markets that, you know, we're not prepared to handle. That, that can be that can be the big part. A big piece and a lot of people sold it in 2008 so so uh, what what's the difference between like a tax attorney would because to me that when i think of protection i think of a, a tax attorney that we have that makes sure that we've got the right enough llc's we don't have too many properties in those llc's blah 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 uh that on the estate planning he's watching the taxes that are changing depending on the administration and then some protection we've gotten or ideas we've gotten, we've gotten from CPAs that, that we've met in mastermind groups and stuff. So tell me what's the difference in that and what you do. Sure. So I think you really have kind of three main partners. It's, it's even better if they all know each other. One, one is your accountant, one is an attorney, and then one is going to be a wealth advisor. And they should all overlap a little bit in their knowledge. But they all have different pieces of expertise, right? They're all looking at different angles, um, different looking around different corners in their future. And so what, what, a lot of what I do and compared to them, I mean, one, I don't file taxes. I'm not a CPA. And then, you know, as an attorney, you know, I don't, uh, I don't set up the LLCs, but really more of kind of, um, you know, fitting in as a visionary person. You know, I always kind of ask people, hey, you're creating what well, you're creating is tremendous, but why are you creating it and what are you going to do with it? At some point, we're all not going to be in this life on this earth, right? Hopefully that's, you know, a long, long time from now. But if we do something significant, there's going to be significant assets to be managed. And why do we even want it beyond financial freedom? What are we doing it for? And for a lot of people, it's just a game, right? It's a game of money is what I call it. But a lot of it is to make significant impact. So my job a lot of times saying, hey, what do we want to do with this? And let's make sure it goes where we want it to go. And what can alter our trajectory of what we're doing today, which could be, you know, not enough cash in a down market. It could be, you know, future income that we're, that we're um, receiving, you know, the taxes go up. So all of a sudden, you know, we could have had some tax-free income, but we're still paying taxes on the income for the second or third time possibly. Um, and so I would, you know, that's kind of the three people, would be your visionary wealth partner, which is sort of my role. And I would call them a visionary wealth partner. Um, and then you've got, um, and then within that, you know, you might have insurance, you know, life insurance, stuff like that, or investment management. It really should be someone as, as I think Dave Ramsey said, the heart of a teacher is your visionary wealth partner. And then your CPA and your attorneys are kind of two different angles. And the thing I'll say about those partners, and I think I've learned they're important, and what I, because I have those partners too, is I want people who are helping me, who are supporting people bigger than me. Because I don't plan on staying where I am, I plan to go somewhere else, right? And so I meet a lot of people, and it could be like either one of you, and, and, and you say, hey, my accountant was great, my attorney was great, my wealth advisor was great, but I kind of outgrow them. I kind of feel like I'm a big deal to them. 
you know, and which is which is great. Hopefully, God kind of gives you great service. But you know, are they seeing the next level for you if they're not accustomed to seeing it? So I actually pay what I believe is probably overpay my accountant because my accountant works their team, works with people of significant wealth more than me, and I'll pay extra to be sure that I'm getting the guidance with the team that I can work with for 30 years. And I would say the same would be the attorney. And then kind of my last piece of advice for both of them is people who are seeing two or three steps ahead. You know, a lot of people say, well, Lindy, you should have done this. Like, well, that didn't help me now. <laughs> Tell me what I should be doing in 2022, what I should be thinking about in 2030. There's the people who are really looking ahead. Because a lot of times as entrepreneurs, our head is down, right? <laughs> We're looking at what's right in front of us. And so part of these, the value of these partners is think, thinking two and three steps ahead so that you can have less roadblocks in the future. Okay, two more questions, then I'll let you fire away, Dana. Uh, um, one question I would ask is, do you just ask those professionals um, what their clientele is like? And then number two question is, can you give us a couple examples of places that you've seen especially realtors, um, not think through that you've been able to either save them money or head them off from something? Yeah, so um, uh, the first question was, sorry, ask the first question again. Yeah, do you, do you just ask those like that CPA? Because I do sometimes yeah. worry that we've outgrown our CPA. Yeah, yeah. And do you just ask them, hey, what's the biggest net worth people that you work with? Or how do you, how do you phrase that yeah, on that answer? Yeah, I would ask them, you pay them money. You know, KW people are good at being direct. What's the average net worth of your client? What's the average income of your client? How many clients do you have that are in my industry? You know, you kind of have people as a profile, right? I would describe Dana as a profile. Business owner, still working hard, you know, certain income level. So how many people kind of fit that profile um, that, that you currently work with? And I think those are all very fair questions. And, and, I've, and I've learned as an advisor just to be honest, you know, I mean, people have asked me questions and I don't really know where they're going. And I've just kind of learned the truth is the truth, right? So just tell the truth. Sometimes I think they might not like my answer and they love my answer. <laughs> you know, but at the end of the day, you know, if we don't have a, a, an honest relationship, then, then what are we really doing in the world? Give me a couple examples of things that you've, you were able to see for for some of your clients that they weren't able to see that were either a protection or a money maker or whatever? Yeah, well, I, I think there's kind of two parts. You know, one, number one is speaking to the traditional realtor. You know, I mean, realtors in my world is very similar. You know, I heard Diana Kikosa say one time, everybody just wants to look good and be right. And so like, we, you know, I'm gonna focus on the looking good. We all wanna look good. We want to look good. We want to dress good. We want to drive cars good. We want good shoes. We want good purses. We want, you know, we want a good house. We want a beautiful home. You know, we think it's going to sell more houses for us. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? You know? And so I think, you know, early on, and, and this is true for still all of us on this call, really visualizing what life you really want and you really need, and then begin to know your numbers and your budget. You know, and really tracking, that's something that I've, I've actually learned from a lot of KW is knowing every dollar in your personal budget, your business budget, you start making a little bit more money, it's easy for a thousand dollars just to start going missing every month. And so really being hard, the, the, the agents that I know who make the most money that are actually building wealth, and a lot of agents make a lot of money, but they aren't really building wealth. The ones building wealth have a budget. And they know they're spending. And they don't get caught up in, you know, the Joneses or, like, oh, we can make it, you know, we can sell a house for a profit. Let's buy a bigger house. Next thing you know, you're in a house that's way more than you really need. And the ones who can, kind of, you know, who have a big dream, a big life, big dream, but they can kind of put some parameters around it of what they really care about. And then begin to stack on top of that. And so really budgeting, one of those is budgeting. The other part is just knowing in the future, we're going to need money. We don't know what we're going to need. We're going to need it for. There's going to be opportunities. And what I have seen, um, you know, if both of you called me and you say, hey, John, I have an opportunity. Do you want to invest? Well, at the, I'm just going to make an assumption. Linda, at the rate that you might invest today, it might be a meaningful number for me to invest with you, right? 
And so if I want to have partners who are extremely successful, I'm going to need more money. I'm going to, the, the, the bar to make the investment might be a hundred thousand, hundred thousand instead of 20,000 or 500,000 instead of a hundred thousand. And so really building that budget to say, okay, I'm going to need money in the future. And I don't know when, how much or why but it's important that I have a system. Just like you have systems in your business, it's important to have a system for my money. You know, and, and you, you never know when and an example would be uh, to someone that, you know, a lot, a lot of what I've recognized in the, in the wealthiest of KW's people, they were in the best position in 2008 with capital. There are a lot of people making the same amount of money, two profiles in 2008. One of them's trying to survive. One of them's just trying to not lose everything because they're over leveraged. And when I'm sitting with a stack of cash saying, I'm about to triple my net worth in five years, which happened, right? And why? Because they were prepared. They were prepared for opportunities that they didn't, they knew were going to exist, but they didn't know when. And I think you see that fundamentally from Gary at the very top, which is, you know, minimizing debt, having cash flow, capital to continue to invest in what you know. And there's going to be times where, you might not find as many good deals. And then there's going to be times that you don't have enough capital for all the good deals you can find. Right. And so you just want to be as capitalized as possible. Um, I just had a couple of things and I really wanted you two to connect. So this was great. <laughs> um, uh, a couple of things, John, just quickly, um, two, two money things and then one leadership thing. Um, one, you talk a lot about, and this was has been something that has really hit home personally with me, is that what a content lifestyle looks like. You kind of touched on that a little bit, um, but will you just speak about that and and kind of how we uh, can buy more things or give things away or create more, but really knowing what a content lifestyle looks like, no matter how much money you're making. Sure, sure. Um... Well, I, I'm not coming on here to preach, but I'm capable of preaching. So I think this is, this is biblical. Um, and regardless if someone believes in that or not, I think the principles are sound. You know, there's there's a difference between content and complacent. And there's, there's uh, writings, and I always just kind of say there's writings by this wise gentleman who lived about 2,000 years ago, and his name was Paul. And he said, I have found the secret of contentment. And, and there's, a, there's a piece that comes with, I have enough, I don't need anything else. That can exist while saying I'm not ever complacent as a person, as a gro- in my growth, as a leader, you know, in, in, in what I want to do for others and who I want to be in an organization. I'm not complacent. But I'm content in what I have. I don't idolize things. I don't idolize people. Um, someone asked me recently, my, our neighbor did a whole new landscape. And we live in a nice neighborhood. And uh, I told my wife recently, it feels good to know we're probably not going to buy a new house here for a long time. But my neighbor put all his money in the landscape. It looks beautiful. Someone's like, oh, now you got to do your yard because they did their yard. And I just kind of tell them, I was like, I like a better way to say this, I don't give a damn what they do with their yard. <laughs> you know, so I think that's something that I have done well, or I've actually worked on. It's just knowing your lane, knowing what you care about, knowing your values. And and we work and make sacrifices for things that we care about. But continuing to understand and identify what do we really need or what do we really want for us to be content and, and then we keep growing as a person and as a leader that we're never complacent. And if you have great systems in business, and both of you know this, money compounds. So your net worth isn't going to stop growing just because you're content. You know, your, your, your net worth is going to stop growing if you make bad financial decisions. But if you put money in the right places and you have a system for it and you allow that money to work, um, then there's no stopping it. So I, I heard David Osborne say one time, you know, there's a velocity, there's a velocity of money that just compounds. And we all know compounding interest, but there's a point that you get that you defy gravity. So unless you make a major mistake, your net worth is not going to stop moving. Right. And so that's what I would say is the difference between content and complacency. 
Love that. Yeah, that's actually a great point about the compounding too. Um, the other thing is you shared one time with a group of individuals and agents about some uh, billionaire families that you had worked with and um, and like what they teach their kids. Do you remember that or do you have that in front of you, like the zero to 10 years? And I just thought that was so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, kind of two, two nuggets I've learned. You know, one, one I worked with, one I, I listened to you speak. And, and so zero to 10 was really uh, your values of your family. And, you know, this is who we are as a family. This is what we believe in. This is how we, this is how we act. This is how we, you know. Uh, I, I joked with a, a, a client yesterday. I said, my family, there's a lot of different ways to invest. But, but I was kind of joking, like, but in our family, this is what we believe in. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and so that's zero to 10, really those values. And then from 10 to 20, it's really beginning to understand money. You know, being able to understand how much is a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars. You know, my son is eight years old, and, and of course, they don't under, have a concept of money. But I still use real numbers sometimes. Fifty thousand dollars. Of course, your eyes get big, but I'm like, at some point, we need to understand the money and how you make money. So that's really ten to twenty. And and it, you know, for all a lot of the listeners that are successful. You know, your, our kids are growing up, or our family members are growing up in a life that we didn't grow up in. Mm-hmm. So talking about that, that scares me to death, actually. That's probably my biggest fear. That and social media with my kids. So talking about these things. And then 20 to 27 is all about really work eth- work ethic professionally. So you, you, you instill that in core values early on. You know, if you want to be good at something in practice, but really from... They were talking about the billionaire family business, right? You have to prove yourself from 20 to 27 before you can enter the family business. And that was by working for other people. Yeah, I love that. And that's, I I remember, Linda, you cannot forget to use that in your Mimi and Pop-Pop camp this year. Uh, Yes, it's definitely going in there. (laughs) There's a Mimi and Pop-Pop camp. I want to hear all about that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Love it. So, um, John... Let's say, for example, I know people are at like different stages that are listening to us, right? So I know in my strategic coach, there's a lot of financial planners. Um, and I know that they, they like you said, they pick an, an, a niche or they, I don't know if it's a dollar amount or whatever. So if somebody needs, they want you as a partner, how does how does someone work with you? How do you get paid? Uh, is there a criteria they have to meet before you're the person for them? Give us some background on all that. Yeah, great. I, I think, John, before you go, I think this is great because I feel like a lot of people think that you have to just be, um, you know, this crazy gazillionaire to work with a with a wealth advisor. Um, and then on the flip side of that, I think sometimes when you start making and you are making a lot of money, it's it's like, well, wait a minute. How, I just think I think this is a really great question. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I've kind of built my, my team mirroring a KW team. And so I'm involved at some level with, with every client, but not the same not the same level with every client. But, but our team is established to really be able to help anybody. Um, and um, then we just started working with one of the realtors that, you know, we kind of met through you and Adam. And kind of helping her get started and getting some fundamental things in place. And my team member, Clark, has really predominantly worked with her. Um, so I would say, you know, for us, I tell people, and again, I, I can preach, but I can also use this language. I, I, at this stage in my career, we just don't work with assholes. That's just what I tell people. So, you know, there's no dollar amount. If someone wants help and someone cares, we, we feel like it's our duty to serve them. And so, you know, if someone's a jerk, you know, I don't know that anyone makes enough money to be a difficult these days. So, um, and then as far as, you know, when or how, I, obviously, if someone, someone emails me usually, um, and my email is john.m.white at nm.com, and then we just have a conversation kind of where, where is someone today? And so sometimes, you know, they know we can meet. It's like, hey, there's a huge opportunity here. I can help you. This is what you should do. Here's a gap in your planning. Other times, it's like, hey, here's three things you should go do. And once you get these three things done, then let's come back and meet. And that can kind of be the beginning stages. 
you know, everything begins with belief and vision and mindset. So if someone, I would really encourage everyone to know, and this is my truth at least, you deserve, you deserve a financial advisor. You deserve people to help you. And if you don't think that way early on, you're less likely to get there where you really believe you need it in the first place, right? So, you know, I'm not, I'm not worth a tremendous amount of money, but I try to still have the mindset that I am that person. I just haven't, I am that person. I just haven't grown into that person yet, or I'm on my way of growing in. And that would really be my, my comment to everybody is that you deserve, you deserve to be who you, who you want to be. And surrounding yourself with those people is part of how you get there. That's great. So I, you gave an uh, email. Um, is there any other way people should reach out to you and your company? Sure. Uh, so our Instagram is probably best. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So uh, on, on Instagram is uh, underscore John M. White. So it's pretty simple. Underscore John M. White. And then on, uh, on Facebook is uh, John McLeod White, which is my, my middle name. So a lot of John Whites out there. So. <laughs> but email, but an email, uh, yeah, as far as like consulting and conversation, e email is best. Awesome. Love it. John, this has been fantastic. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and to I totally learned a lot. So I, I love I love it because I, I think a lot of people think like I did. Either I felt like I wasn't making enough money for a financial planner. And then when I was, I felt like I was already making money. Why would I need one? So I love the clarity and I love it. Uh, and I love that tripod of a team uh, that you talked about. That's awesome. If you have a question, a comment, uh, a challenge, opportunity that you'd like for Dana and I to discuss, or you have a great guest that you think we should interview, be sure and reach out to us at Everything Life and Real Estate, uh, info at Everything Life and Real Estate. And um, also, if you haven't, please hit subscribe. And we'd love for you to pass our name along, our podcast along to somebody that you think that would benefit from our conversations and uh, the greatest compliment you can give Dana and I is a five-star review. So Dana, thank you. John, thank you. And Dana, I guess I'll talk to you next week. Sounds good. Thank you, John, so much. Thank you, thank you both. Take care. Be sure to subscribe for more business strategies and tactics to inspire you to live an abundant real estate life. Don't forget to rate and review so we can bring you the best content. Find this and other valuable information at everythinglifeandrealestate.com.